Good evening and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Bible Study in the Book of Revelation. Tonight is study number 16 of Revelation chapter 6. And we're going to be reading from verse 12 of chapter 6. And it, it says there, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Now, we've um, progressed to the opening of the sixth seal, the Lamb the Lord Jesus Christ is taking the seals off of the book that was in the right hand of God. And this book is the Bible. It is uh, pointing to the gospel program of God that will be revealed. Now, now some of these things occurred um, throughout the church age. For instance, when Christ was riding a white horse and went forth conquering to conquer. And Satan is typified as being on the red horse, who is is also going forth, taking peace from the earth. And that described the spiritual battle that took place all throughout the New Testament era, including the church age. But God is just indicating that all of the information concerning his program of salvation and judgment His gospel will now be opened up at the time of the end, as was said to the prophet Daniel, seal up the word until the time of the end, and then knowledge will increase. And so God is giving us an overview of the uh, sending forth of his word during the church age, of the great tribulation, of judgment day, of the souls under the altar with the opening of the fifth seal who were uh, crying out how long until God avenges their blood. And now the opening of the sixth seal, it is describing a great earthquake and the sun becoming black as sackcloth of hair and the moon becoming as blood and the stars of heaven falling to the earth. Now, that language is familiar to us, although it is somewhat different, yet it fits in with the language of Matthew chapter 24. And let me read that verse. Matthew 24, in verse 29, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And so we have all the same elements, the uh, sun, moon, and stars. We have the, the shaking of the heaven and, and, and so forth. And, and this is describing what is taking place immediately after the tribulation of those days. And, and we have learned by God's grace, as he has opened up this information to, that the Great Tribulation lasted for 23 years, from May 21, 1988, through May 21, 2011. An exact 23-year period, an exact 8,400 days. And notice that Revelation 6.12 refers to a great earthquake, when uh, the sixth seal was removed. Lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black. And, and then the language continues. This is tying together a great earthquake with the darkening of the sun, which happens immediately after the tribulation. Now, you, you might remember that it was thought in the days leading up to May 21, as we approached that that day, that May 21, 2011 would be the day of a great 
worldwide earthquake we we had thought. And one of the reasons is this verse and and we'll also go to a couple other verses that that make this link together between the darkening of the sun and an earthquake. And and, and we know that that the darkening of the sun identifies with May 21 as immediately after the tribulation. And uh, this is why we had thought, well, it will be the end of the great tribulation, and therefore there will be a great earthquake which God will use to raise the dead. Now, uh, it was um, assumed that it would be the resurrection. We were incorrect about a physical earthquake, and we were incorrect about the resurrection of the dead on that day. But but um, let's just look at Matthew 27, and we'll see why the, the language of an earthquake um, made us think also of a resurrection. In Matthew 27, verse 50, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. And then in Matthew chapter 28, it says in verse 2, And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. And then in verse 6, He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, Come, see the place where the Lord lay. And in both of these places, a great earthquake was uh, identified with resurrection. In chapter 27, many bodies of the saints which slept arose in connection with the great earth or with the earthquake. And in chapter 28, Christ arose as the earthquake rolled back the stone. And and so we we see this language of resurrection in combination with the earthquake and the darkening of the sun, and and these things uh, from our position of looking toward the day of judgment, that from that vantage point, caused us to think, well, here's what's going to happen. There, it, it, it's judgment day, uh, after all, and we were right about that, and it's a time of a great earthquake, and uh, the Bible says this, and and we also notice that an earthquake is used by God to bring about resurrection. What a what a perfect means to open the ground in order to raise the dead, and and we thought that would be the time of the resurrection of the bodies of the saints, and they would go to be with the Lord and the living saints would be raptured on that day because, well, uh, if that was the day of the resurrection, uh, the First Thessalonians passage in First Thessalonians chapter 4 joins together the resurrection and the rapture and, and so forth. And we thought the dead or the unsaved dead would rise up just in a physical way and be left scattered uh, literally upon the earth. And this was incorrect because we were thinking physically. We were thinking of a great physical earthquake. And, and let me just look at some other verses that, where God does describe uh, an earthquake. And in the context, it has to do with Judgment Day. In Joel chapter 2, it says in verse 10, the earth shall quake before them, the heaven shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Uh, and then in Joel chapter 3, it says in verses 15 and 16, The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Jehovah also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. 
but Jehovah will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Now in both of these places, we read of an earthquake where it says the earth shall shake. That's describing an earthquake. And the sun, moon, and stars being darkened or the stars falling. And, and this relates to the verse in Matthew 24, 29, immediately after the tribulation that the sun is darkened. And so we, we began to form this conclusion. Now in Isaiah chapter 13, in Isaiah 13, it says, in, beginning in verse 9, Behold, the day of Jehovah cometh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. And I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of Jehovah of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. The word remove in Isaiah 13, 13 is uh, the same word as shake that we read in Joel 3, 16. The heavens and the earth shall shake. And here, Isaiah 13, 13, I will shake the heavens and the earth shall shake out of her place. Again, in the context of the darkened sun and moon, there is an earthquake. And now, uh, what really should have um, caught our attention and, and should have put us on guard was that we were understanding um, prior to May 21, in the days leading up to that point, that the darkened sun, moon, and stars was spiritual. No one thought, uh, no one was teaching that I'm aware of, that it would be literally the sun being darkened and the moon not giving its light and the stars falling. No one was teaching that. It was understood, well, this is a spiritual reference to the removal of the gospel lights. Obviously, since we had thought there would be five months of torment on earth after that great earthquake, that there could not be that duration of time without a sun, without a moon, and without stars. And if stars were falling to the earth, as Revelation chapter 6 describes, well, there wouldn't be any earth. As soon as one star got anywhere near us, we would be burned up. And, and there would be no way that five months of time could pass, especially as the sun, moon, and stars are the timekeepers that God put in place to keep track of time, to measure the 24-hour period. And, and without them, you would have no time. You would not be able to have days or weeks or months. And, and so it was very obvious that it was a spiritual reference to the removal of the gospel. And, and yet, hand in hand, God joined together the darkened sun with the language of an earthquake. And we were um, mistaken, we were incorrect, and we thought that on one hand the darkened sun will be spiritually the removal of the gospel and of salvation, and on the other hand, the great earthquake would be physical, and, and it was completely wrong. So we made an error in that regard because we misunderstood the nature of the Bible. We misunderstood what would happen on the day of judgment. We were thinking physically God will make the judgment apparent to all of those that are under his wrath. And that's not what he did at all. He 
took the cup of wrath that he had first given to the churches, which was entirely spiritual in nature, and he gave the identical cup to the unsaved inhabitants of the earth, and they are drinking it from May 21, 2011 on up until today, and it will continue for a period of time until the, the time period for the Day of Judgment elapses. And it is all spiritual, all until we get to the last day of the total length for Judgment Day, and then God will literally, he must, of course, destroy the earth, the universe, the entire uh, corrupt creation, and recreate a new heavens and, and new earth. Well, you see, the great earthquake that we're reading about then in Revelation chapter 6 is not a physical or a literal earthquake. And again, let me read Revelation 6, verse 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. You see how they're, they're joined hand in hand. They're joined together. You, you can't understand one part as spiritual and the other as physical, as a, a, a plain literal statement. No, both are describing something spiritual. Well, what could God have in view through that earthquake? Well, let me, uh, let me look at a couple of verses, and, and then we'll, we'll take a look at that question. In Isaiah chapter 24, now Isaiah 24 is a chapter that details in, in extensive coverage the judgment of the world in the day of judgment, our present time period, at verse after verse after verse, and God uses the word earth repeatedly so that there is no mistaking the judgment that's being described. It is not uh, discussing the judgment on the churches, but the judgment on the world. For instance, it says in verse 4 of Isaiah 24, The earth mourneth and fadeth away. The world languisheth and fadeth away. The haughty people of the earth do languish. The earth, in verse 5, also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof, because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men left. And, and by the way, that, uh, that last statement in Isaiah 24, 6 is describing the true believers. The, the inhabitants of the earth are burned with a spiritual fire that has been kindled in God's anger as he brought to pass the day of judgment. And yet the true believers are living on the earth in the day of judgment. And, and therefore we are left, a few men left. Why, why does he say that? Well, we know the believers are a remnant of the whole. But also, the Bible tells us many are called and few are chosen. So as the rest of the inhabitants of the earth are burned, there are a few men left that are not burned. We, we are placed in the fire, spiritually. A fiery trial is underway, trying our faith, but we're not burned. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were cast into a, a, a burning, fiery furnace heated seven times more than it was wont to be heated, and yet they were not burned at all. And God is using this time period to try the faith of his people, and they will come forth safely and perfected as gold and silver through the fire, purified and made better. It will not harm them in the slightest way. Well, in this chapter, that is uh, in verse after verse after verse describing the day of judgment, we read in verse 17 and 18, Fear and the pit and the snare are upon thee, O inhabitant of the earth. And it shall come to pass that he who fleeth from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit 
and he that cometh up out of the midst of the pit shall be taken in the snare. For the windows from on high are open, and the foundations of the earth do shake. And, and that is a significant statement. The windows from on high are open. Why is that significant? Well, remember what God said that when he brought the flood upon the world. In Genesis chapter 7, in verse 11, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month. Now let me stop there because that is, this is the day that the flood began. It was the 17th day of the second month. Now, uh, let me remind you, because we, we really haven't covered this uh, extensively like we did before, and, and we're prone to forget that May 21 of 2011 had the underlying Hebrew calendar date of the 17th day of the second month. And the year 2011 was exactly 7,000 years from the flood. And, and so this date, but historically in Genesis 7, was exactly seven days from the time that God had forewarned Noah and told him, yet seven days and I will bring a flood of waters to destroy the earth. And seven days later, on the 17th day of the second month, God did so, and he shut Noah and his family, all eight souls, into the ark, and they were, uh, they were protected, their safety was guaranteed, they were safe from the destructive forces of the floodwaters. And, and that's a picture of salvation in Christ, as that ark typified the Lord Jesus. And likewise, God tells us in 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, to be not ignorant of this one thing that one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. And he tells us that, he makes that statement in the context of the flood of Noah's day and linking it together with the end of the world. And right in the middle of those two judgments, he tells us a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. And uh, we have biblical justification to look at the seven-day statement to Noah and to understand it as though God is saying to the world and to his people, you have 7,000 years to find salvation from this point, 7,000 years from the flood date of 4990 BC, and then 7,000 years later, I will shut the door to heaven once every one of the elect whose names were recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life have been found and, and they have been saved. Then I will shut the door. There is no more to become saved and I will bring judgment on the world. And that's exactly what God did 7,000 years later, we could say, to the self-same day as May 21, 2011 had the underlying Hebrew calendar date of 217, which matched up perfectly with the day that God shut the door on the ark. And then he shut the door to heaven. And notice the language again here in Genesis 7, verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were open, and the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. Now, the Lord is describing the historical um, deluge, the flood that began on that day, and he describes it as the windows of heaven were open. Well, Isaiah 24 is describing Judgment Day, which took place on May 21 of 2011, which took place on the 17th day of the second month. And notice 
at the end of verse 18, For the windows from on high are open, and the foundations of the earth do shake. And that language matches, it agrees with the, the flood language that began on the day that ties in May 21. And, and the word shake is the same word that's found in Joel 3 in verse 16 and Isaiah 13 verse 13. The earthquake is taking place at a time when the windows from on high are open. And, and uh, you know, it's also significant that God speaks of the flood, uh, the rain at the beginning, raining for 40 days and 40 nights. So that would mean in, in the spiritual dimension, the underlying spiritual dimension that's in that account, as 2.17 relates 7,000 years later to May 21, that there will come a time of testing, testing from the point of judgment, from the point when the door is shut and the rain begins and, and the Lord speaks of raining for 40 days and 40 nights. And it so happens that we've learned that Judgment Day may continue for 1,600 days, which is 40 times 40, which would mean that God has been testing since May 21, since he opened the windows of heaven, as Isaiah 24, 18 tells us, since the earth, the foundations of the earth began to shake, a great earthquake, took place spiritually on that day. A spiritual earthquake, a spiritual darkening of the sun and of the moon, a spiritual falling of the stars. Well, there, there's so much for us to look at, so much for us to learn uh, as far as what God has done. And, and now we have the superior vantage point of entering into the Day of Judgment past May 21 so that we can readily see and quickly realize that, of course, it wasn't physical. It never was meant to be physical. It was all spiritual. And now we can make correction to that uh, faulty understanding we held previously and since there was no physical earthquake, well, that would also mean that, uh, that that's what led us to think it would be the time of the resurrection, or, or it gave a lot of evidence to that idea. And, and yet there is no physical earthquake. So the resurrection, we also were off on. No, that will take place on the last day of the Day of Judgment. Well, Lord willing, when we get together in our next study, we're going to continue looking at a great earthquake, and we'll see how God connects something very unusual to that great earthquake or to the language of a great earthquake, and yet it fits precisely. It, it fits what God did on the day of judgment and on these days that have followed.